Howdy, everybody. My name is Chet Donnelly. I'm a spine surgeon in Dallas, Texas. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the augmented reality and spine surgery and kind of where we're going in 2024. So, so first of all, my disclosures are that most of these slides were initially made by one of my best friends, Dr. A.J. Rush. I thought this picture was appropriate because similar to augmented reality, you can kind of see through the skin and you can see the bones. I have zero financial interest with any augmented reality system. I'm going to talk about one more so than others in this just because that's the one I'm experienced with. Um, but my email address is at the end of the presentation if any of them want to talk. And I'm just kidding. Uh, so there's different types of reality. And the two that I want to just highlight, there's virtual reality. And there's also augmented reality. So virtual reality is what most of us kind of grew up with. It's just the concept of you can have like this digital world or you can put on a headset and you're living in a different reality. And that's all good and all. But uh, the thing I'm talking about specifically is augmented reality. So it takes our actual world concepts and it has overlays over it. And that's kind of what augmented reality is. So virtual reality is kind of like Tron or having the metaverse augmented reality it would be similar to either games you can even have on your phone where you're looking around the room and you can see different things or even just your car having the projection of your speed or uh, different traffic things that it's in the actual world you're at so the real world applications of this just in terms of before we get to the spine applications are you know what is the point of augmented reality and really when you think about it as of right now it's really all about navigation some of these things are a little silly and we don't really need, but for instance, airport navigation, there's special glasses or Google glasses or goggles out there. We're kind of show you where your flight is and where to go in the airport. Fine. That's a little not necessarily needed right now, or maybe it is um, for skiing. There's different technologies out there that shows where your buddies are on the slopes, your elevation, your track, your speed. It kind of tracks it there. Phone calls, text messages coming in. There's a good safety component to that. Instead of looking at your phone or trying to get lost from your friends, you could be using this navigation technology that's readily available. Those goggles are just like $300, and that's good. And then biker navigation. That's one where it kind of tracks their speed, how much traffic they're creating for everyone else out there, and things like that. Uh, but do we really need this? And that's kind of one of the arguments. Um, and that's a big maybe. Well, what about kind of the other apps? of it and that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit more about today so this is a uh, virtual reality ironically uh, representation of kind of how this system works for those that haven't seen it this is a specific companies and but this is how most of them work where you have this headset on and this is exactly how you see it you have an axial view you have a sagittal view and the reps in the room can zoom in zoom out make that different um, um, fonts sorry different contrast as well as the size of it and you just have your tools that are navigated that go in there similar to normal navigation but with the augmented reality it's just right in front of you you're not having to look up at a screen during that entire time and as someone who does a lot of navigated cases both before the system without this system is definitely faster it's way way faster that's not 100 percent the reason to use it uh, it's just another tool but i'll kind of get to that and this is kind of how it looks you have the screen in the back it helps you tr navigate your screws it helps keep the whole team involved you know what screw you're going to need it helps you kind of plan during the case um, even more efficiently now kind of jumping back to what are the other applications of this you know it really became more popularized initially with the military applications instead of fighter pilots having to look down at their um, instrumentation it was projected on them and that's just a big real world component in 2023 there's multiple different types of augmented reality headsets a lot of them are these different glasses uh, you can see different medical applications, Google Glasses, the Oculus Rift, just different ways that it's projected onto your field. So this kind of goes to what's the point of all this augmented reality? Why do we even need it? And it all stems back from one concept that every spine surgeon, whether true or untrue, says that they're working towards. And that's MIS, minimally invasive surgery. So from my standpoint, kind of the first thing you have to ask is, well, why aren't you doing minimally invasive surgery if not? And that's how augmented reality is going to change this narrative. So one, it's the visualization. You have to navigate the balancing options with the procedure complexity. MIS screws, you know, this MIS screw, some of them are a little tricky to use and you might not like using the towers. You might not like um, the direct and indirect reduction you have to do with the towers. Radiation. I'm terrified of radiation. I've known several people even in my young career who've had radiation issues because they were maybe more the pioneers of mis technology and they've had what i call weird cancers and it just sucks is it from the radiation is it from the mis use who knows but um, that's a modifiable risk factor i'm terrified of radiation that's kind of what initially got me to start using more navigation um, and the other challenges are with fluoroscopy is kind of your tech you know who is your tech of the day and that's that's a tough thing and that's a big part of the things who's shooting those images 
images. Well, look, here's some of the benefits of MIS, and I don't need to lecture y'all. If y'all are watching this or at this course, I'm very sure you're an MIS surgeon. But decreased blood loss, length of stay, revision rates. I'm sure everyone can show papers on either side arguing either way. Um, I jokingly say the ability to add minimally invasive spine surgeon to your LinkedIn account, because that seems to be all the rage these days. At the end of the day, it's just doing best for your patient. And if minimally invasive surgery is the way to do it, Two ways we were putting in our screws in 2023 is either with fluoroscopy or navigation, traditional navigation, robotics, and those are great. But look, there's back, there's there's flaws to that. With fluoroscopy, it's very tech dependent. You don't know who you're going to get that day, and you don't know how their skill level is. You ask them a Ferguson, a Rainbow, they're just confused, and it's honestly embarrassing kind of the level of quality we get sometimes in these fluoroscopy dependent cases, and that's a big deal. There's also they're expensive, and there's a large footprint. Same thing with traditional navigation. I mean, those things are very expensive. And they have a huge footprint. If you're the only spine surgeon using that equipment, that just takes up a lot of real estate and a lot of space. And that's just tough to have uh, to justify in an ambulatory surgery center or even in your hospital. And there's also a big learning curve. Most of those things take at least 30 cases or three to six months, kind of depending on which studies you look at. And that's not super short, but it's also not super long. So I love peer-reviewed data, and here's a study from 2019 that looked at the difference of radiation with navigation, so not necessarily augmented reality, but um, navigation versus traditional fluoroscopy. And essentially what it found, they looked at the patient versus um, the surgeon looking at multiple cases from a traditional lumbar spinal fusion. And what they found is when you use navigation, the there's such a decrease of radiation, but the patient gets a lot more radiation when you use navigation. And so that becomes maybe the moral dilemma. You know, is it worth giving the patient more radiation if that means it's less radiation for the anesthesiologist, surgeon, scrub tech, PA, uh, circulator? There's just a lot of other people that benefit when you do navigation. Another great study in JNS looked at the accuracy of just using augmented reality. This is one of the more early studies coming out of Rush that really just validated how accurate can these be. And in their study, when they uh, placed many, many screws and many different surgeons doing it, they found the accuracy rate in the lumbar sacral junction or lumbar sacral area to be up to 100%, the thoracic 98%. Again, cadaver study, but it's still important just to prove the concept. Another study I like to highlight, this one's also out of Rush, great institution, by the famous Dr. Alex Butler, who's now at uh, Lenox Hill. But this one looked at um, the experience level and does it have a threshold to start getting good with it. And what's kind of interesting, even over a two-year span, the speed and the um, efficiency of the cases didn't really change. And that's actually thought to be a good thing, just showing that there's not a big learning curve, that people can get used to this very fast and get proficient with it very fast. Okay, so here's another benefit of the spine surgery. I've mentioned multiple things here in terms of the augmented reality, where there is definitely shown to be improved accuracy. It is considered minimally invasive. You have decreased radiation. And the key thing is, is it faster? Is it faster than traditional freehand? Is it traditional uh, faster than traditional nav? And it's thought to be, the answer is yes. <clears throat> so how does this work? So usually in this system I'm highlighting, I'm not going to mention the company name specifically, but it's a headset you put on and there's multiple ways for it to work. You have these screens that come down and it projects your images. There's a light overhead. So, you know, when I'm doing either a mini Wiltsy or perk screws, I have them lower the OR lights, turn the this light on my helmet and I can make my incisions and kind of go from there. And here's exactly how it looks is you have this screen that's in front of you. You can still see through it if you want. You can see the axial, sagittal, as well as um, the underneath field. And it's very helpful. I'm going to show you some actual things. There's a side monitor in the room to help kind of keep the team, the reps engaged. It's also really good from a uh, educational standpoint. Huge, huge, huge benefits from a residency and medical student treatment. And here's the normal workflow. You know, you drape the patient, all that great stuff there. And then usually you're having the circulator or sorry, the scrub tech in the meantime calibrate the instruments, pretty similar to the regular um, traditional navigation in terms of calibrating it. I don't think that's any faster or any slower. Where I do think you make up a lot of time is actually, uh, so you do the PSIS pin, then you spin, and then once you do that, you do the tool verification and then the screw placement. And the thing that really makes it fast is just the way it marks out your trajectories. And you can do multiple trajectories at once, and it can go very, very fast. It's very... Um, intuitive. It doesn't really interrupt the normal flow you're already doing. You do need to stop for a CT spin. Then that's when usually I'll have my helmet placed at that point, And there's just a shorter learning curve. The also benefit of this system compared to maybe some other traditional or even robotic systems is that it's an open platform. This system, at least the one that I'm showing here is the Augmetics one. They don't even make 
screws. So like they're not going to force you to say, oh, if you use this robot, you really need to use these screws. And that's great. And here's kind of what it looks like. This is under the helmet. This is also in the screen. And it just shows you as you're putting it in. And again, this is the screw projection, but pretend it's like the burr or something like that. They can kind of give you an idea of your screw length. It's all projected there. And it just speeds up the um, efficiency and accuracy of the case. And that's usually how I use it. I can put this here again. This is a screw that's already shown there. But you can imagine, even when I'm putting this there, like, hmm, probably need a 30 screw to um, get to the edge of the bone there. It could go longer if you do bicortical. I'm not making that argument here. But it's also good in revision cases. Uh, it's also good you don't fall into that same screw trajectory and kind of having your face right there, looking at the patient, having your all your um, muscle memory there is a really helpful way to kind of go about having better screw trajectories. Uh, another nice benefit of it is when I do these indirect decompression cases, I'm a big proponent of posterior lateral fusion. So I'll actually use my burr, navigate it after the screws are down, and I'll decorticate the facet joint. And I can really see that well. I can really do that very safely and accurately. And also decorticate the transverse process, and that's shown here. You can also, I don't have a picture of it, but you could, um, kind of next level thing, but you can navigate a funnel to place your graft either in that facet, kind of tough, as well as along the posterior lateral aspects. You can navigate your graft. Um, that's a great way to do it. So this just shows, again, that I navigate and decorticate the uh, facets to help with the fusion. So in 2024, you know, you might be thinking, oh, I do screws great. I don't need this expensive technology, even though it's less expensive than the other stuff. Well, here's where it's going. And you can be an early adapter or wait for it to get there. But this is going to be used in the future for osteotomy planning, helping you know where to make your cuts in the bone. It can be helpful for decompression assistance. Imagine if this got paired up with something like the bone scalpel and it showed you exactly where to make your cuts to protect the pars as well as just to get the area you need. It can help you with some midline sparing approaches. Another great thing is let's get this in the endoscopic field. This is another great way where instead of looking at a screen or using all those x-ray shots to get your um, to get your scope in there, you can be doing this endoscopically. Uh, you can combine this with the robotic arm and you can also get real-time feedback. Maybe it tells you, it shows the change in the bone as it's going. It uses some of this artificial intelligence we keep hearing about uh, to really change the aspects of the bone. The other thing I think is going to be really cool about this is sagittal balance. It can help you maybe when you're doing your osteotomy corrections, maybe showing you how many more degrees to pull two tulips together and to get an appropriate lordosis that you're trying to build in. Uh, a big flaw of the program now, in my opinion, is this is just a big clunky headset and um, I'm not as strong as other people, but um, it's just a lot of weight to be wearing. And so if we can get a little smaller glasses, even goggles, and those are very much coming down the pipeline, but that'd be great. The other thing that's not there yet, but coming down the pipeline is what if we can, just like the Globus system, do a preoperative CT and then just use fluoroscopy to register. Well, that'd be great, especially in ambulatory surgery centers. And then predictive learning, kind of knowing what screws you're going to want based on what you used on the other side or other levels is key. So why is augmented reality part of the future? Look, I think it's accurate. It makes us better surgeons. It's efficient. It goes to the normal flow of the case, but speeds it up. I think it's economical. There's not a huge capital expense. These things are usually in 2023, 2024, around $200,000, whereas the robotic systems could be a million plus. Um, so I'm not saying $200,000 isn't a lot of money, but it's a lot cheaper than some of the other systems. And then it's transportable. You know, this is something where it's just a tower in the helmet. You can bring this to other centers if it's yours, and you don't have to just keep the robot there in the closet at your one center. So with that, it's going to be – I got two little screens there. Sorry about that. Um, but now you can see me three times, so you're welcome. Uh, but the whole goal of this is – you know, what is your goal through augmented reality? Are you trying to go faster? Are you trying to be safer? Are you trying to make surgery easier? You know, it's going to be slow in the in the beginning. The staff is going to be the bottleneck. They might not want to set it up. They might not enjoy it as much as some of the other things. And so it's just always going to be a bottleneck issue to get it into your hospital. You need to determine, is this going to make you busier? Is this going to make you faster at surgery? Is this going to be less anesthesia time for the patient? And you also need to support your peers. Reach out to other people that are using this technology, that are using other enabling technologies, and get their input. See where they're having their challenges as well as their benefits. So I'm not here to answer questions. I wish I was there. I'm beyond flattered to be asked. I'm actually at another course. And then through flight issues, I'm not going to East Coast for a specific time. Not going to work. But I really, really do appreciate being there. Um, anyone um, get my cell phone those are my email addresses I'd love to answer additional questions on it or just anything spine related and with that I thanks everyone for the time